So I welcome you all tonight and everyone in YouTube land. Hello. <laughs> to a very auspicious evening. Some of you know the details of the changes in my personal life. If not, pinned to the top of my Facebook page, I wrote a very beautiful description of what has happened. And in what appears to be a loss, could only be described as a gift of many gains. I meet you tonight on what would have been my year and a half anniversary. With a heart brimming with love, as I honor the different shape it wishes to take. And in a moment like this, where I owe it to each and every one of you. To not just show you my journey, but to invite you to be a part of it just as you have so lovingly invited me to be a part of yours. This can become our journey. And tonight's journey is called loving fearlessly. There's a reason why I emphasize love in all of my teachings. There's a reason why my teachings always have to be the most loving, kind, and heart-centered approach. Because as a result of my lifetime of experiences, awakenings, <laughs> visions, ongoing dialogues with the universe, It's not that I'm good at recognizing the divine in all things. I can't not see divinity wherever I look. And at a certain point, the recognition of divinity can become so integrated to where you can honor the divine in all things while still holding appropriate space for you and others as individuals. And so because integration is such a necessity in the journey of either healing, awakening, or transformation, I offer you the most integrated energy so that we can not just know what we know, but we can embody all that is here to be known. Because in mastery, it doesn't actually matter what you know, it only matters how much you are or can embody it. And 
There are many of us that know that love is the highest vibration, that love is what we seek, that love is what we're designed to receive and to give. That in our natural state, love is how the divinity within us acknowledges the divinity of others in a moment of sacred union, whether between lovers, friends, neighbors, or family members, or strangers. We know that, and some of us, whether we want to admit it or not, love fearfully. Dipping our toes into the coolness of the water, but not close enough for a wave to get us and pull us out into the deep waters. And if you were allowing yourself to step into the water and let a wave take you, it would only deliver you where you are always destined to be. So when we are still living in a state of fear, the metaphorical wave of life is a threat to your livelihood. And as you awaken, that wave becomes less of a threat and more of a spiritual mode of transportation. The wave always knows where you're meant to go. The question is, will you allow it to take you there? And I sit with you in a moment of awe in my journey. In this moment, the wave is taking me there. And I'm taking all of you with me. And we, together, are going there. And where we're going is the land of loving fearlessly. Awakening is a great benchmark and milestone in your journey. Many layers and levels to awakening. And the reason I always touch on teachings from many different angles is because I'm always teaching from different dimensional vantage points. Because there's the awakening out of the third dimension, the fourth, the fifth, and it goes on and on and on. And each time it's actually different. So I always teach from different dimensional standpoints. But what awakening is designed to do is to actually prepare you to love fearlessly. Awakening is not a guarantee that once you're awake, only the best possibilities you desire show up. Which is why when adversity strikes someone's life and they said, but I thought I was awake. The universe just gives us time and space to unravel that limiting belief. And if you think that awakening absolves you of the human journey, it becomes the inner judgment towards yourself as if I must not be awake if things like this are happening or that person had something bad to them, they must not be awake. Mm. And it becomes a very subtle way of unknowingly and innocently getting lost in something that we could call 
spiritual materialism. I like to call it object consciousness. Where one believes that if they reach a certain level of consciousness, that it's like when Pac-Man eats the fruit and becomes invincible. The difference is the more awake you are, the more graceful you move with the wave. The less you fight what comes to take you home. And when you are awake, you are in such irreverent awe of the perfection of how this story is written that it may not be the outcome you had hoped for, but it has to be the highest outcome for a destiny you may not see on the horizon. Life is too perfect for it not to be incredible. Here's another way of putting it. I just love the intimacy of this energy right now. I can feel it. I'm like, oh, this feels so good. <clears throat> A couple of retreats ago, I stood up. For thir- I stood up for the first time, and it was amazing, and I taught standing up. <laughs> and it was amazing. But I've actually decided to sit. And the reason is, well, there's a couple of reasons. Some people in YouTube land, hello, said, I like it better when he sits. I thought, well, oh, that's interesting. And I started to really tune into the energy and the sitting lets the energy be more focused and concentrated. And because, and the biggest reason is when you're here with me, you're sitting. So I want to sit with you. I don't stand above you. I sit with you. And when you stand, I stand, and we walk together. And metaphorically, that feels really nice to me. So here's an interesting way of looking at this. If life is going to bring you something greater than you've ever imagined, it would begin by life not giving you what you wanted. (laughs) So if you had something you wanted, and now you find yourself not, the only reason could be that life is making what you wanted disappear so that something you couldn't even imagine could enter. And then someone would say, how do I know? (laughs) How don't you know? Why wouldn't that be the reason? Why wouldn't that be the reason? When what you have goes away, life's making space to give you something so incredible, it will blow your mind off your your shoulders. Blow your head completely apart. (laughs) And here's the amazing thing. You don't even have to be grateful for when something disappears out of your life unless it naturally arises. Because there's this other mania that says, oh, I should be grateful because what we secretly think is, I want to hurry up and try to be grateful so the universe can see what a good little boy and girl I am (laughs) and give me more treats. (laughs) 
I gotta hurry up and do the really good spiritual thing so the angels will be very impressed with me. <laughs> oh wow, look, we devastated them. Look, they're already in the vibration of gratitude. Well done. <laughs> well done. Throw them a bone. Whoa. Whoa. You laugh when I put it out like that, but how many of us secretly totally believe that? That when, when shit happens to me, I have to hurry up and do the spiritual hokey pokey <laughs> so that life will be rather impressed with my behavior and give me a different set of circumstances. <laughs> and I say this just to free us. But the truth is that in order for life to give you a reality beyond your wildest imagination is to first either not give you what you want or take from you the very thing that you always wanted. And although there is a law of attraction, the law of attraction is more of an ongoing universal principle that is more about the nature of surrender and the code of the universe to always bring you outcomes and circumstances that while may always inspire change, can only change you for the better. The law of attraction is not necessarily about manifesting desires. And I'll explain why. I've said this a few times in different places, but it's good to say this. It's not like manifesting is wrong. I just want to be very clear on how I specifically say this. So people walk around, Matt just said, <laughs> manifesting is wrong. You know? I'm not saying that. It's not wrong. Here's a funny way to put it. Manifesting is not wrong. It's just in order to manifest, you're actually not necessary. <laughs> is, and I'll explain. That's a funny thing to think about. You're going to manifest your highest reality and you are not even necessary for it to happen. That's how perfectly written this thing is. Here's why. So let's say you all of a sudden have a desire for something that you don't currently have. And you say, by the power vested in me, or whatever words you know, <laughs> resonate with you, I, the holy creator, or whatever formal, you know, name you'd like to take on, I as the Holy Creator, manifest this desire into form now. Do a little dance, wave your wand, whatever. And at that moment, you state your desire. And then shortly after, you start getting all of this evidence. Like that. <laughs> That's the official sound that we are manifesting right now. That's it. Look, I'll help you see through the facade of manifesting. Still doesn't mean I'm not amazing at it. And what's amazing about me teaching this is I'm incredible at manifesting. But here's what I want you to think about. So you have a desire, you stay by the power of vested in me as the Holy Creator, I manifest this desire into form, and so it is, love and light. Namaste, Hakuna Matata, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Sprinkle some glitter, whatever you got to do. And shortly after, usually after that sound, we start manifesting evidence that this creation is coming to you. And then when it actually starts coming to you, you say to yourself, I'm manifesting my desire. But what if your desire 
was only intuitively picking up on what was entering your field of reality, and you stating that you're going to manifest it was just acknowledging that this that is incoming into your reality is welcome to enter. And of course you're saying it's welcome to enter because it was always meant to be there. And what most people don't clearly understand is that if you hadn't have had the desire, if you hadn't have stated that you're going to attract it, if you hadn't allowed it, it would have showed up the same. So manifestation is not about you asserting your will to make invisible things visible. It's about being so in tune with the flow. (laughs) (laughs) Being so in tune with the flow that you are actually becoming aware, psychically aware, that the seemingly invisible things are becoming visible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So everything manifests from the invisible to the tangibly visible. You don't have to actually play a part in that. And if you surrendered the need to manifest, or try to manifest your you-know-what off every second of the day, it's all going to show up at the perfect moment in time. And often what happens is something as well-intended as manifestation, which its purpose is to get you to dream bigger, to open up to the fact that down the road, days from now, months from now, it's always going to get better. It's always going to feel better. Circumstances are always going to change, for better or for worse. And we open up to trusting the field of reality to take us on a journey and help us become who we're born to be. But somewhere in all of this, manifestation became like spiritual Amazon Prime. You know? <laughs> when I was a kid, we didn't have vision boarding. You know what we had when I was a kid? It's called layaway. You ever had that? <laughs> we had layaway. That was our vision board. My mom would take me to a store. I'd try in the Michael Jackson jacket. Remember the one with all the zippers? That when I was seven, I wanted for, for whatever reason. And we go, oh, honey, you're going to get this jacket. I'm going to get this jacket? Yeah, it's going to be on layaway. Say, what? What's layaway? I don't, I don't even know what that means. I didn't like that. Layaway? That means that your jacket is going to be kept behind the counter. <laughs> and you're going to get it probably two months after everyone stops wearing it. <laughs> am I? I am. Wow. Super duper. Super duper. (laughs) But when you're entrenched in the depths of awakening and your heart and as energetically sensible souls, I respect you with giving you really, really deep, groundbreaking, ultra real teachings because you're already on a journey of awakening. and, and, And in order for us to really wake up fully, we have to embrace the most heart-centered and the highest level teachings. Because the paradox is that your vibration is by and large among the highest vibration of beings on this planet, but your conditioning causes you to perceive and think often from the lowest common denominator. So imagine you are of the highest vibration perceiving, thinking, and believing from the lowest common denominator, which is a product of the unconscious of the planet, and that creates an inner conflict. You have the intention of doing the most high-level spiritual work, but the approach is one of trying to beg and plead with the universe to rearrange the furniture of your life. 
instead of surrendering and saying, there has to be a reason why this is happening. Of course, we make changes when necessary. If you're in a abusive relationship, I say this almost every video because it's so important to say, accepting what is is not staying in an abusive household. Right? Sometimes you're in a situation where the only thing you're meant to learn from someone is how to develop the courage to walk away. And whether that's true for you or someone you know, we all know that one. We all know that one. But by and large, what we find in the depths of awakening, where your deepest wisdom is confronting the most desperate of conditioning inside of you. And when that collision happens, often called dark night of the soul, and when that happens, manifestation almost becomes this weird form of denial, spiritual denial, where you are actually trying to negotiate and bargain with the perfection of existence. And it will listen, but it will not respond. That's why I'm here, to translate. And you don't have to work hard to try to figure out what life wants from you or what does and doesn't work. Time does that for you. Is something meant to be? Time will tell you. When is it meant to happen? The moment time says so. But Matt, what can I do to cause that time to happen sooner? <laughs> but you see, if we were to make something happen sooner, it would get in the way of the other things that were meant to happen first. Time doesn't cut in its own line. It's like if you went to a restaurant during breakfast and you said, but I would like to order from the dinner menu. Well, it's breakfast. So perhaps you'd like to look at this side of the menu. Anything on this side, we can do. And you flip the menu over. But I like this side. Many of our customers at nighttime also do. <laughs> but we're on this side right now. But I want it to be on this side. Well, you should come back at 5. <laughs> and it will be. Do you see? Do you see? Or have you ever gone to a restaurant five minutes after they stop serving breakfast? You ever had that one? Oh, we're not serving breakfast anymore. No, but you can. You can serve breakfast. But they won't. Why won't they? <laughs> Do you ever have that? Why won't you? you have, I know you have all the stuff. It was five minutes ago. You have it all in there. I know it's in there. I know you have it all in there. Because everything in life is a precise measurement and activity of time. Everything happens at an exact measurable moment. Not sooner, not later. There was an exact moment where your mother went from pregnant to no longer pregnant. There's an exact moment where someone takes their official last breath and transitions. The consciousness of why time exists as a fourth dimensional reality, because fourth dimension is time. Third dimension is the old paradigm, object consciousness, the land in which ego evolves, setting the stage for the awakening of consciousness. Fifth dimension is the unity consciousness, where a human being is living in the flow of reality, one with the divine and respecting that divinity in all things. Fourth dimension is the time it takes each of us to align with the new and to wake up out of the old. So everything is about time. 
And time is constant. But because time is molded out of the fabric of space, each measurable moment can seem as quick, short-lived, or as long-winded as you may perceive it to be. Have you ever had a moment that was so pleasurable and it seemed like time went by instantaneously fast? Have you ever had a moment that was not so fun it seemed to take forever? So based on our level of consciousness, our level of consciousness is actually showing us our relationship with time. And when you are what's called in the flow, being in the flow means time is a friend, not an enemy. If you currently do not have what you want in your life, it's an opportunity to say to time, thank you for giving me more room to unravel my limiting beliefs, to see through my tendency to blame myself for not having what I want, and to take the time to prepare myself and purify my heart so the amazing things I'm meant to have can be received with humility and joy. Thank you. Thank you, time, for not giving me what I want. If everyone got everything they wanted the moment they wanted it, do you know what would happen? The evolution of consciousness would stop and everyone would be completely insane. You think people, you think people are crazy right now? The only thing that makes people crazier is getting what they want. Getting what you want is lovely. It's lovely. But what happens to ego consciousness when it gets so much of what it wants, it has nothing to want anymore? To those that don't have what they want right now, they think, well, that sounds great because you don't have what you want. But if you were to have everything you'd want to the point where there's nothing to want anymore, you'd soon find that your ego would be in a crisis. The same crisis that we're in when we, when we don't have what we want. So not having what we want and getting what we want creates the same ego crisis, and the crisis is the awakening of consciousness as the ego erodes. As we wake up, we learn we only get what we get at a certain moment of time. Things come, things go at a precise moment in time. And the organizing intelligence is that everything only comes and goes at specific moments of time and space based on its ability to instigate in you either the healing of a core wound, the triggering of your greater expansion, to move you into the next level of your highest potential. That is exactly why I wrote the book, Everything is Here to Help You. I wrote the book because I've been living it, and in this moment, I live it deeper than I could have ever imagined. When good things happen in my life, I say thank you for this experience. When unexpected things happen, I say thank you for this experience. It's one of the bravest things you can ever do. Thank you for this experience. Thank you. And what allows you to stop bargaining with the perfection of existence, to stop believing that you have to do X, Y, and Z before better things happen. I mean, isn't that the hypnosis, no matter what dimension you're living in? Even if you're living in a personal reality, I have to do X, Y, and Z for better things to personally happen. I have to do X, Y, and Z in order for 
things to happen in the workplace. And I know it often looks like that. But it only looks like that, and you're only in situations where that seems to be the case because of the level of consciousness we're viewing from. And then on a spiritual journey, most people don't actually enter a higher level of consciousness. This is actually a very interesting thing. Most people on a spiritual journey do not enter into a higher level of consciousness. They enter into a higher level of negotiation. <laughs> and instead of saying, I have to do X, Y, and Z before different things happen to me, it's I have to do X, Y, and Z in order to wake up, heal, ascend. What's the difference? It's the same conversation. And it's not true. The only reason why you have a vision of what's meant to be is so that you can appreciate how whatever is right now is a part of that unfolding. You only see a sneak preview of a movie and have a glimpse of Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves hooking up so that you make your way through the 90 minutes to see how it happened. So vision is not required in order for you to create or have what you want. Vision is just helping you deepen your faith. And oftentimes, limiting beliefs, especially limiting spiritual beliefs, are just the things you tell yourself in between what's already meant to be. From now until you're meant to have what you want, whether that means gaining and losing, gaining and losing, gaining and losing, you have the right to tell yourself anything you desire. And you can make it your business to decide that you are the reason why good things or bad things seem to happen. And all that's going to do is create a certain perception of reality where you are either with or against time. And all that does is it determines whether your happiness is reclaimed right now, no matter how unfortunate your circumstances feel, or if you're going to project your happiness onto the anticipation of a future pending reality. So when we are awake beings, we are not waiting for future in order to open the gifts of the present. We come alive right now, and we realize we don't need life to make us promises. We just know in our hearts that whether I get what I want, I gain it, I lose it. It comes and goes. Each and every milestone, confrontation, relationship, and encounter could only change me for the better. And what your free will, because a lot of you will hear me say this and go, oh, it sounds like predetermination. What's the free will in that? Our free will is determining how aligned in the light we wish to be, which determines how clear we perceive this reality, which determines how helpful we are to ourselves and others, which determines how painful or pleasurable and insightful every moment is. Here's something I learned when I visited the Akashic Records of Heaven throughout my life, where I've literally been led out of my body and gone to the Akashic Records. Every outcome in your life is destined to be. But do you know what is optional? How little or how much you choose to learn from it. You've been given a ticket to the movie theater. You've been given the right to watch every scene but you determine how much time you spend sitting in the chair, watching the screen. You can go to the movies and spend most time standing in the concession line waiting for a hot dog, <laughs> which we know would be a veggie dog, right? Veggie dog, of course. Of course. Imagine going to a theater to see this big movie 
and for 45 minutes, you're in line getting popcorn or a soda or candy. And then you come back to your seat and you go, hey, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on There's a lot of stuff you missed. And then you go, oh my God, I'm totally lost. I should come back and see it again. Do you know what that's called? Reincarnation. <laughs> so you decide how much you're going to learn from this lifetime. It's all already written. You decide, you, de you decide how open you're going to be, how fearless you're going to be, how loving you're going to be, how courageous you're going to be. And you decide how much you're going to grow and you decide how much you're going to learn and benefit from this journey. And it's not even that you go to the Akashic Records after you cross over and some team of angels goes, wow, you really stunk up the joint down there. <laughs> we sent you down as the Messiah and someone found an open bar. <laughs> so we're gonna send you back. Maybe you'll get it right again. That's not what happens. What happens is you rewatch your life on the holographic screens and you go, if I had only known then what I can now see from my soul's perspective, I would have done so many different things different. And we are as souls the one that begged to come back. And then you come back into a body and you think there's no way I asked to come back here. <laughs> oh, but you did. Oh, but you did. Oh. Earth is... Earth is like begging your parents to take you to Disneyland <laughs> when you're not here. And then you're here and you go, what is all the hype about? <laughs> Why did I want to come here? There are all these rides, but I have to wait in line? <laughs> My parents didn't get me that fast pass thing. <laughs> fast pass? I didn't have that when I went to Disneyland. You know what we had when I was a kid? Wait your turn, that's what we had. <laughs> Wait your turn, that's what we had. Wait your turn. Fast pass. As adults, we have fast pass, it's called TSA PreCheck. Yeah. But now everyone has that, so now it's just the same line again. <laughs> it's amazing. Isn't life amazing? But when you're in heaven, you want to come here. And you're like, I want, this is the fantasy. I am going to go back down there, and I'm going to totally do it all, and I'm going to be completely as awake as I am in heaven, and I'm going to totally do it the way I want to do it. And you come back down, take the water slide down from heaven, and your birth happens, lights, camera, action, and the plan goes out the window. But that's what life's about. Outcomes predetermined. Outcomes predetermined. And we can talk about, yes, of course, there are parallel dimensions and so many options. Because as you are choosing to grow and to evolve, you will be weaving in and out of different dimensional possibilities. But part of the human, and I'm just trying to be nice about Part of the human condition, which is a little bit of an illness, it's an illness. Human condition, the illness, is we think, what do I have to do differently to get to the good stuff? And that's when life looks down and goes, they're still drunk. They still need to sober up. Because that's not the right approach on the spiritual journey. What do I have to do in order to get my way? Do you feel that? Like even when I say that, I literally want to move my chair over in case a lightning bolt comes. <laughs> because it's completely contradictory with the harmony of life. It would be like a tree saying, what do I have to learn in order to make winter shorter? And the answer is, your perception of winter will shorten when you're in harmony with it. 
And then the illness says, will that give me what I want? <laughs> no, but it will change your experience. And that elucidates a very specific tenant about ego consciousness. Ego doesn't want better experiences. It wants better objects. And if it can't get what it wants, it doesn't care about feeling better. It only wants to feel better because it thinks feeling better is what it wants. So if what you want is feeling better and that's an object, now we ask ourselves the question, what have I done wrong to cause myself to feel bad? Who do I have to apologize to to clear my debt with the universe? And what do I have to learn to get the hell out of this nightmare? And we are fighting with life. And at that moment, we are more than likely loving fearfully and not loving fearlessly. And the way we unravel this condition within us is by loving the parts of us that are so afraid to step out, give themselves fully to the moment. And whether you get the response you desire to be faithfully accepting that everything that I attract could only be the highest potential to inspire change that could only change me for the better. That's how we love fearlessly. We give everything in our heart to the moment at hand and we do not ask for a promise of any kind. because the ongoing rule of thumb is that everything will be exactly the way it is until it's time to change. And no promise anyone can make you will change that. A promise can only be made at a current level of consciousness. And if you are guided to be at a different level of consciousness, that promise may not resonate with you anymore. Are you supposed to maintain integrity to a promise that another version of you made that doesn't resonate with you anymore? Is that supposed to be the way it is? That doesn't feel right. The only promise that can be made is I promise to be true to myself and to be honest with others and true to myself every step of the way. to enjoy and respect and honor what I'm given, and to not hide from the fact that things are destined to change. And when it does, it may hurt, it might break me down, it might rip me apart, but I accept it can only be the means that breaks me open. The only promise that can be made is, I faithfully walk through the fire with the hand of God. May you open me up as I refuse to ever shut down. These are the words of loving fearlessly. But Matt, I gave my heart to someone and they didn't reciprocate. You simply wrote, wrote the right letter and, it, and you sent it to the wrong address. And life gave you back that letter so you can potentially find the person it's meant to go to. So isn't that a helpful thing? But I wanted it to be that person. I know. I know. but life has bigger plans for all of us. And imagine being so entrenched in wanting something so specific that if you don't get it, or someone seems to play the role of taking it from you, you're willing to turn against 
their divinity, which is to turn against your divinity, to persecute them as your enemy, to condemn them as a less than character because they dared to not give you what you want. That to me sounds like an illness, a condition that needs to be healed. And we heal it by loving fearlessly. And for a lot of us, it doesn't begin by stepping out and giving all of yourself to another person if that doesn't feel like the next appropriate step. We're all, we're all gonna get there. We really will. But loving fearlessly begins by daring to love yourself fearlessly, which means to embrace the parts of yourself that only know how to love fearfully. The you that only knows how to be happy when you get what you want. And to be able to radically look at yourself directly and say, even when I get what I want, I often then soon just pivot to wanting other things I don't have. It's kind of an illness. And, if, and the way I'm describing it it, it, it has the potential to really just expand your consciousness to see life differently. There's nothing wrong with having desires. So desire away. But to tell yourself that I'm not going to be whole until something that's not here shows up, doesn't that seem like a setup for failure? Mm-hmm. Until the things that are not here Show up. I'm worthless, unlovable. And if that doesn't feel good in your body to hear me say it, the not so good feeling in your body is your highest intelligence saying, by the way, you have the free will to consider that, but the emotional response in your body tells you how untruthful it is because the highest truths always bring relief, even if it's a sobering amount of relief. Like in the things I'm sharing with you, it can feel very sobering. And to the ego, it may not feel pleasant, but we can always feel, you know what? I can feel the relief in that. Truth always feels like relief, even if it's the relief you don't really want. Like, I really don't want to look at that truth, but it's true. And what's so amazing about how the ego often adopts a spiritual persona and as a way of trying to avoid its own unraveling in the awakening, it takes on a spiritual persona and becomes a spiritual ego. From regular garden variety ego to a spiritual ego. When I teach like this, it gets horrified to think like, oh my God, that's not how life works. Like the ego wants the law of attraction to exist the way it was taught. But here's what's so weird about that. Most people believe the law of attraction works the way it doesn't seem to work in your life. Meaning people go, I believe that if I work hard enough and I beg, borrow, and steal and I hack into the universe like a big computer program and I rewire some shit, (laughs) I'm going to get what I want. And the people that defend that process are not actually mostly living having what they want. But they insist that the process works even though all they've been given is more time to stay busy with a process that doesn't work for them. Isn't that strange? So I'm here to liberate you from what occupies a lot of attention, but is not the end-all, be-all point of this. The end-all, be-all of this is you are waking up, preparing to love fearlessly to access a level of consciousness that says whether I get what I want, I don't get what I want, or everything I want is taken away, I'm going to unleash all of myself onto this world for the well-being of all. 
That's loving fearlessly. That the worst thing that can happen to you is not having something you desire taken from you. The worst thing that can happen is a split second in your reality where you hold back you from shining in the presence and glory of this world. Even one moment where you hold back you from unleashing your perfection onto this earth plane is the worst case scenario. So we have come together tonight to align. Does that mean we're manifesting more? Yes. Yes, it does. We are here to align with the highest vibration of what is the destiny of heart-centered beings, energetically sensitive souls, which is to embody the light of our soul in physical form and to shine the light that raises the vibration of the planet that will then allow all of the social programs, all of the new political infrastructures, and all the things we want to see take shape and form in life can actually take shape and form and stick because the vibration of the planet is at a frequency to allow it. We're fertilizing the soil and we're planting the seeds and we're watering what will soon become the harvest to transform an entire world. We are the faithful gardeners of an awakening consciousness and loving fearlessly is how we do it. We just have to start getting really clear on the way in which we move through time and space and to make this a game of alignment, how aligned in love and faith and my highest consciousness will I allow myself to be and not embodying a high frequency that is expressed through an old, outdated, broken mentality. When that imbalance happens, we, we experience things like frustration, boredom, confusion, loneliness, which are the four gateways that pass you through the fourth dimension out of the third and into the fifth. You pass through loneliness, frustration, boredom, and confusion. And how do we pass through those four gates? By loving each of those parts of ourselves fearlessly. by saying to those four aspects of an outdated paradigm, life, thank you for confusing me so to shuffle around my reference points so I don't see through a broken point of view. Thank you for making me lonely so that I can actually face the parts of myself that beg for my love that I often project onto other people to help me satisfy. Life, thank you for frustrating me so that what used to be my five-year plan can be thrown out the window so that the bigger plan life has for me can come into view. Life, thank you for boring me mercilessly <laughs> so that I can see that it's not all about what I do but the things I do when I'm most aligned with my highest, most loving consciousness. Thank you for waking me the hell up. And thank you for not giving me exactly what I wanted when I wasn't ready. Thank you for listening to all my begging and pleading, but not responding so I would have a celestial being to argue with. That's what families are for. <laughs> Some families at least.
And here's why loving fear, fearlessly is the new tenant of the love revolution, the pioneering theme of the new spiritual paradigm. Because in ego consciousness, and I don't judge, you know, I of all people have a very beautiful relationship with ego. It's a child we love, not a character to track down and chase out of town. <laughs> right? The old spiritual paradigm is all about building this lynch mob that go through town, <laughs> knocking on doors, looking for ego. <laughs> looking for ego. Looking for ego, it's stinking up the joint. It's not how this goes down. When you've been taught that, that I gotta really get rid of this ego, you develop the vibration of self-denial. Self-denial is the reality of neglect. And we wind up neglecting ourselves and denying ourselves through spiritual ideology to bring us back to the fact, to our original core wound, as a result of those who neglected us in our childhood. So it's just bringing us right back to the wound, but we get so transfixed and mesmerized by the spiritual ideology that we think we have a spiritual reason to deny the self. And the people that deny the self know the most about the absolute realms or maybe people that are craving the absolute realms the most. And the reason why beings like that can't find God is because God is right here being you. So you gotta be a person. That's why I'm teaching the way I'm teaching. I have no problem being a person. I don't think a person is less than. I don't think a person is below. I don't think a person is like, oh God, a person person with feelings and thoughts. I don't keep track of time because then I'd think I'm a person. If I think I'm a person, then I'm not being God. Like, what, what do people, I don't, I don't know where all this stuff came from. I don't. I don't know what happened. <laughs> really, God? Does everything have to exist? Really? Really? <laughs> There's a lot of limiting belief systems out there. And you get as much time as you need to explore some of these beautiful, well-intended teachings. But a teaching's job is only to take you to the next level. And some people hold on to teachings well past their shelf life. <laughs> like you open up someone's refrigerator and you look at something and you go, I'm not sure that's still good. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. I don't think it's fine. I think it's growing hair. I think that's not good. It, was it started out as ketchup, now it's kombucha. And there are beliefs and there are teachings that are well past their shelf life. There are teachings that will literally only meant to be with you for five minutes out of your entire life's journey. Some of the highest level teachings will burn out in you faster than you can embrace them. A lot of the non-dual pointers to absolute consciousness, you're just meant to taste the absolute even when you realize you're the absolute. I've lived in a state of samadhi for 15 years. I don't have to have the experiences of realization. I live as realization. And I live as realization because realization prepared me to return back to my body and be a person. That's the round trip ticket. <laughs> and if you think you got kicked out of enlightenment land and you fell from grace and came back here you're under the most unfortunate misunderstanding you think it's about, we're supposed to run to enlightenment and just play around there and do whatever we can to not come back here that's, that's denial and avoidance. We go up into the celestial realms, we see the highest perfection. Oh my God, I'm everything, I'm all that is. Good, now we'll go be a person. <laughs> go be the all that is as you. 
Go be the all that is in a world where characters are created to pretend they will not understand what you're talking about when you try to tell them about all that is. <laughs> no, we're one. And the one is dressed up as a character going, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Why is that? Why is the one denying your testimony about the one? Because the one is trying to tell you, stay in character. <laughs> Have an opinion. Follow your heart. Stand for something. Be a person. You don't like what you see? Do something about it. I look around the world. I'm not in conflict with anything. I don't particularly like certain things I see, so I'm doing something about it. And you know what I'm doing about it? I'm following my guidance to be here with you and transmit this energy to help awaken the mastery and angels in all of you, and then we all collectively do something else about it. That's my role. That's my purpose. I'm doing something about it, and this is what I was born to do. And if there's something else I'm called to do, I'll do that too, which is why in the new iteration of my offerings, what I call all for love. Donations will be regularly made to charities I'm working with. And I'll be letting all of you know, here's a donation that was made, here's who it affected, and here's the change that we manifested as a result of coming together. That's what I want to do about it. So I'm doing everything I can that I'm called to do. And each of us have to do that. But in order to do that, you have to be a person and you have to be willing to be a person and know being a person as a spiritually aligned being in an emotional body is one of the most high level journeys there is. Enlightenment is reality, but enlightenment in a fully integrated emotional body, that's hardcore. That's hardcore. Where you don't need to say that we're all one, you can just feel what's happening in someone else's body as if it's happening in yours. So wherever you go out to, whether you go out in meditation, whether you go out from some sort of plant medicine ceremony, whether you go out from just as a result of life flipping your circumstances upside down and you just completely wake up out of nowhere or in the midst of childbirth or whatever happens in your death experience, wherever you go, you're going to come back and you're going to have to finish the job. And you wake up to be able to, oh, I guess that means we all just woke up. Ta-da, we all just woke up, everybody. There we go. I mean, you wake up because you're going to live out your life the way it was scripted to be. But you will decide how much of you you bring to each moment. You'll decide how much of your heart is going to be open. You're going to decide how much you're going to give to each moment. You're going to decide how enthusiastically you're going to be and how unleashed and open you're going to be and how faithful and fearless you will be in each moment. You will ultimately decide how much of your soul shines into this world. And even if it only feels like each moment you're just bringing a little bit more and a little bit more, that's all you can do. What can you do in this moment to just take the next step to being more open and fearless and trusting and expressive than ever before? That's all that you have to ask yourself. And then once you do that, good. And now, what's the next thing I can do? And every moment, just take a step forward. Oh my God, there's a person I'm about to talk to. Maybe I should compliment them. Why? Just to practice, get all my weird energy out. Because <laughs> when you're energetically sensitive of a high consciousness, and it's coming through a body that's still conditioned by Human imprinting, we get socially weird, don't we? <laughs> you, ever, you ever talk to someone, right? And usually it's like, you know, God dresses up as like store clerks just to help us work out our stuff. Right? Someone's, hi, how you doing? Hi, right? You, you talk louder than you need to. You ever done that? You ever done that? 
like you're talking in full capital typed letters? You ever gotten a text from someone that's all capital letters or an email? Like their caps lock was whatever, and it's like shouting. Hi, how are you doing? They say, how are you? <laughs> Be awesome if we were just you know, honest about it. I'm learning how to be normal. <laughs> In case you haven't guessed, not there yet. Not there yet at all. I don't feel normal at all right now. Hey, while we're being honest, I have a question for you, store clerk. Why do you hate me? Do you hate me? Because I'd like for you to like me, but I think you hate me. Is there anything I can do for you not to hate me? Oh, I should enter my pin code. Oh. That's what we're actually here to do is work out our weirdness because the spiritual journey is actually not about educating your mind. Now, your mind's not another enemy. It's not another thing like run your mind out of town. That's another one of those teachings, right? It's either the ego's the problem or the mind's the problem. And every week we add a different problem. That's the broken spiritual paradigm is we're going we're gonna to define a problem and then we're going to make up a process to try to fix and get rid of the problem. That has never worked. Ever. Ever. The mind's not the problem. It's just that your mind can gravitate to spiritual insight faster than your nervous system can get rewired. Here's the thing. And I said this in another video. I said, you're not on your spiritual journey, your body is. Your nervous system is actually being rewired by your spiritual journey. And the process of rewiring your nervous system is a lot more intricate of a journey than it takes your mind to resonate with insight. So part of the issue is that people will go, I already know this, Matt, but you're not watching this video, you're not here in person, because you don't know something. You're here because the energy I radiate is continuously rewiring your nervous system. People are not embodying a high vibration because they don't know something. And how many of us have gone, if I can just get this person to know what they don't know, they're gonna just have a much bigger vibration and I'll like being around them and it'll be fantastic. People are not at a lower vibration because of what they don't know. They're at a lower vibration because their nervous system has yet to be rewired and the old paradigm is still in the familiar category and the new reality is still in the foreign category and anything of the new that is foreign gets deleted out of their awareness. You ever tried to tell something, someone something really insightful and their eyes rolling back of their head? That's our nervous system deleting your insight. <laughs> I that happened once, I was at a, some sort of block party, and I was just having, you know, I, you know, having some hors d'oeuvres, and someone goes, oh, what do you do for a living? I go, oh, I'm, I'm a spiritual teacher. Just, <laughs> <laughs> oh, spiritual, I'm not ready for that. That's five lifetimes from now. Delete, delete. <laughs> and I'm just there to prepare their nervous system for what's about to happen. Oh yeah, you're about to be a spiritual weirdo. You are. Yeah, and I'm just gonna prepare you by saying some very key words that will start to familiarize you to this wild acid trip. And their nervous system goes, that's foreign, delete, 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 right? But that's, that, that, so, so this journey is really about kindness and love because we're actually being loving to our nervous systems. Even like the teachings of resistance, that's another thing. Oh, resistance is the enemy. I got to stop resisting. When you resist something, that's your nervous system saying you are considering something that's of a higher level of consciousness than your nervous system can currently handle. And resistance is saying you can do this but it's gonna be a little painful because you're gonna put yourself into a newer level of consciousness and the resistance is your nervous system having to catch up at a really fast rate. You can do it, but it might be pretty intense. 
Or you can say, I meant to do that, but the resistance is telling me my nervous system isn't quite ready. So let me actually do some more inner healing work so my nervous system can be more on board and be more familiar with this new level of reality. And then all of me can make the leap at the same time. Doesn't that feel loving? Mm -hmm. Like to not say, oh my God, this is happening because I'm resisting. And as long as I'm resisting, life's not gonna give me what I want. <laughs> what? What? For reals? For reals? You only resist what your nervous system isn't prepared to receive. So when there's resistance, it may be what your mind wants, but it's what your innocence isn't ready to take in. And isn't that insightful to know it? Wow, I really want that, but I actually feel some resistance. So resistance is telling me that, wow, it's good that you want that, but I'm not quite ready to handle that. I must not have the worthiness to totally let it in without making me a nervous wreck. So I should really take some time to love myself so I can actually be in alignment with the thing that I want. Doesn't that feel loving? Yes. Yeah. Resistance is teaching you things. It's insightful. That's why I wrote Everything is Here to Help You. Everything is insightful. It's never something we have to push or power through. Feel the peace in the room. Be kind to your nervous system. Oh my God, I imagine what I want, and when I imagine what I want, it freaks me out. That means that your nervous system has been trained to be afraid of the things that feel good because you have a core wound where at a certain time in your life you felt good and then it was either taken from you or the people that you associated with goodness seemed to turn on you. And that is where we heal, not where we judge ourselves and we use spiritual work to push and push and push and bully ourselves. If you could come face to face with the gravity of what you have survived from your earliest upbringing to now, you would never talk to yourself disrespectfully ever again. And if you can come face to face with just tuning in vibrationally to what the world has faced and overcome ancestrally and in this lifetime, you would never disrespect the healing journey of another human being again, no matter how they speak to you. Because when people are rude, they're in a healing crisis. And what is taking them over and putting them to sleep is their core unresolved wounds. When people treat us disrespectfully, it is their pain talking to a being of a higher vibration, begging for our forgiveness to liberate them into the light. I'm not saying that justifies being in situations where people treat you unfortunately, but we don't have to respond to other people's pain with the damage of judgment. Because one of the most high level expressions of awakened consciousness and the single greatest thing we can all do to create world peace is to allow pain to transform us into greater alignment with the flow of reality. And to create world peace, we allow things to play out the way they're gonna play out, and it might even hurt. But the one thing we do to create peace is when we hurt, we learn how to hurt so consciously and nobly, so not to respond by hurting another. We do not perpetuate the cycle, we break it. And when you are hurt and do not hurt back or hurt yourself, the cycle is broken. That's why hurt exists. Hurt exists to teach us that we as energetically sensitive beings feel like we've been hurt the most. Do you know why? Because in a world of denial, we know how to face it. 
We just don't know how to give ourselves credit for the things we do well. And I want to give you and everyone around the world who's a part of this love revolution the utmost respect and credit. And the credit that says we have been hurt because we know how to feel and we know how to allow it to transform us for a world that is still hiding from its own unprocessed pain. We're doing this for an entire planet, an entire civilization, an entire species. And if you say, but I don't want to do that, it's not a matter if you choose to, it's a matter of recognizing that you have been chosen. Someone once asked me, Matt, did I choose this on some level? And you know what my most astute answer is? You were chosen. Don't think about it like I must have chosen this. Because if you don't remember being in heaven and signing this agreement, <laughs> most of us just assume that spiritually. I must have chosen this. No, no, no. You were chosen. And you chose what chose you. We get chosen for missions. And we come into these bodies and we learn how to become angels and master guides for future incarnations. And we are told that we are going to guide the life and the spiritual evolution of a human being. And then when we come down here and through the laws of oneness, you realize that while looking around for the being you're going to lead and evolve, that the being you are evolving and guiding is the body you inhabit. So your consciousness is an angel in training. The one you are guiding is the character you are playing, and the healing at hand is the rewiring of your nervous system. And the reconfiguration of your subconscious mind and the activation of new DNA where we are subconsciously resonating with the light and making the unknown familiar instead of foreign and changing the fabric of reality simply by how fearlessly we choose to love ourselves and others. And we always start with us. Because when you say, I love you to your heart, I love you to your own heart can only be the words from the angel and master guide within you. When you say, I love you, you are becoming the universe supporting the character, not the character trying to figure out their way. So as master guides of this earth plane, as evolving earth angels, we flip the perspective into cosmic consciousness. And instead of thinking we're the characters trying to connect with reality, we are reality playing out the life and times of a character. And we do that by focusing our attention on our heart, knowing our heart is the center of the universe, and through the heart that we love, all things are transformed through the law of oneness. And we say to this heart and to all hearts, I love you. 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 
I'm thankful and grateful that the one I love and I've had the joy of loving is sitting front row for this new beginning. Thank you for this experience. For all the events we've been at together, whenever I do the I love yous, I always look at her. And if this is the last time I have the chance to do that, I thank you. I will never stop loving. And I don't wipe my tears because there are always more to follow. Sometimes tears of joy Sometimes tears of confusion, sometimes tears of pain. And all I know how to do is say thank you for choosing me. Thank you for choosing me. And thank you for letting me choose you. I'm a better man because of it. And I am here with you all, and we are here together. We are here to really do this together. And I sit with you more inspired, more excited, and more unleashed to lead what we are creating into this world. And in this new beginning, and what is the first step of many that brings us together, I invite us to come together as one and to really do this the way it needs to be done. I am so proud of this community of mature, heart-centered beings where we create an energy where anyone who comes into our gatherings, our retreats, is welcomed, feels safe, can express themselves. And we are pioneering a brand new conscious community. one that is real, one that is useful, one that is beneficial. Where we come together to support each other, to face the gravity. Of life's unfolding grace. And whether we see the bigger picture or it's still downloading in view, we have the support of each other. And everything I have to give you to help us find our way. And we're doing this together. Together as one. We don't need to subscribe to the beliefs of if I do this, then this will happen. We don't have time for that. There's too much pain in the world for that. We only have time for one thing, and that's thank you for choosing me and to love fearlessly.
and to certainly not get distracted by fourth dimensional insights that go, but if you love full on, what comes goes and it's gonna be taken from you anyway, so what's the point? That's like going to Disneyland and going, I, I rode these rides and where I started is exactly where I came back to. <laughs> so what's the point? I'm just gonna sit on the bench and be a know-it-all. I'm gonna sit on the bench. Oh, these rides are pointless. They don't take you anywhere. You loop around, you loop around, you come right back. I wait in line to go and come back. I went nowhere. <laughs> when in the reality of loving fearlessly, you bought a ticket, you were let through the gates of Disneyland. Now eat cotton candy, <laughs> ride the Matterhorn, and barf your guts out like the rest of us. Okay? Because that's what we do in the magical kingdom. Live your life. Learn from each moment. Again, you have the choice to learn from every moment, but here's what is of a spiritual falsehood. The falsehood is, what could I learn from this so not to do it again in the future? Avoidance. You will do what you will do on repeat until life is done showing you. What can I learn to make sure this doesn't happen again? Superstitious perception. And that means that we're not in right relationship with pain. That means we're not aligned with time. That means that there's more to be cleared out of us and we will only get better. Hey, Matt, what did you learn from this experience in your life? I'll tell you what I learned. That from since the beginning of time, like you, I've done nothing wrong. I was born of love, and I was born to love, and I will never stop loving this world, myself, or another. And when I take my last breath, my journey will continue in different dimensional realities. Sometimes you're in a reality where it seems like you have the opportunity to choose love. But for energetically sensitive beings, we are not necessarily choosing to love, but recognizing that love is so instinctive, we don't know how to stop. And if we don't know how to stop loving, it must be a skill. And if you look around and say, but I'm loving, but other people don't, my reality don't seem very loving because we are leading the way and we are showing the world that it's safe to come out of hiding and while the ego is afraid of being dissolved by the light, the light is saying, come out of hiding, a new reality is here. We are leading the way. And when you are so pure in your giving, your, giving, your love and your giving is so pure, you will be fulfilled by what you give. And not so devastated by what you don't get. And there are moments such as this for me where it has nothing to do with how I perceive or view life. I don't even have to choose acceptance. I breathe acceptance. <laughs> I thought I'd turn this phone off. <laughs> and even in this state of acceptance I, I live in, in samadhi, acceptance is breath. You don't have to, and when you're in samadhi, when you're living in, Awake awareness, abiding. 
You don't choose acceptance. It, acceptance just is. And devastation will still come for you. The difference is, devastation won't be your enemy. It will be an auspicious stream of tears that pool together, that creates a current of a river that sweeps you off of shore only to take you to where you're meant to be, a mode of transportation. My current is taking me and it's only taking me home. And you know where home is for me? In this body right here. This is my home. This is where I wanna be. And I wanna be here with each and every one of you. And I wanna help you wanna learn how to be here too. Because things are ramping up. But it can get a lot more miraculous and a lot less painful if we take the direct route. And that is why tonight's invitation is inspiring and inviting you to join me in loving fearlessly. Because Unless we're living fearlessly, we're just on some level waiting to die. And that's not why we came to life. So from this moment forward, we love fearlessly. And if you don't find yourself able to love fearlessly, you still have a rightful position and place in the love revolution. For those who cannot love fearlessly, sit still and love those who fearlessly love to bring it to life within them. We fearlessly love so that we can do what enlightenment and awakening prepares us to do, which is to faithfully live. So here's to life. Here's to our new beginning. And as always, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you.